Excellent. So welcome, everyone. My name is Malcolm Saunders, and I have with me a very special guest, Luca Simmons of Good Food and You. Thanks for being on, Luca. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always a treat to chat with you. And in, this, in these days of feeling like we're not allowed to leave our house, I so miss humans. Right? And I miss seeing your sweet face. So it's nice to at least cyber see it. Yeah, awesome. Well, really appreciate all you're doing online. I know you've really stepped up and uh, just want to give Luca major, major props for, for keeping it real all this time, you know, before and during the pandemic. Uh, this is ground zero. This is, this is roots. This is community. This is health. You are sharing information that is accessible, that's grounded, that's practical. You are helping people in so many ways. And I know you have like lists and lists and lists and lists of testimonials and comments of people that you have helped. And uh, I know people feel, they feel overwhelmed. They feel disempowered. They feel like, what can we do? And uh, you, you just keep bringing it back to this. This is what we can do, you know, eat real food. And I love how you explain things. I love how you simplify things and you just bring it, bring it back right to that personal level that we can implement in our families and our communities. And uh, this is, this is the power. This is why we're having this conversation and we're going to be touching upon the subject that I know is near and dear to your heart. It's about what a foot down from your heart. Um, but they're closely connected anyway. They are. That's right. Yeah, sure. You're going to be sharing all about this idea of the gut is ground zero, like literally for everything, for feeling good, for immunity, for digestion, for on and on and on and on and on. It's all about the gut. And uh, yeah, so anyone watching, you know, please post in your comments, your questions, share this out. Uh, this is information that uh, we all need. We all, you know, should be learning this in school. And uh, I think that's probably my biggest disappointment, you know, you know, throughout this whole pandemic. It's like, where's the basic, you know, common sense health advice? Um, yes, we're facing something new. Yes, we're facing something novel. Yes, there are, you know, precautions we can take. But, you know, again, I think it's just, it's a, it's a result. It's a, a symptom of, of a society that, that's very unhealthy because as a society, we haven't put our health first and foremost. We haven't educated ourselves. We don't know how to take care of ourselves. And so when a little virus comes through, we are so vulnerable. We are so susceptible and we get so confused. And so I'm really glad that you're here just to bring it all back down to basics to really empower us with this knowledge, this information. And yeah, can't thank you enough for, for being on, Luca. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It's true. I was thinking about this the other day, how like, and I've, this has been a recurring theme for me, how I feel like so much of kind of the, some of the hardships that we're going through right now and some of the things we're meeting, I wonder how much of it is coming up because we've come to now outsource so much stuff to others that we've forgotten to insource. What do we have access to insource for ourselves that would have been traditional wisdom, like you say, that traditional knowledge, the common sense that would have been shared from one generation to the next. And we're getting a little bit far away from that common sense that would have been passed down. And here we are. Well, how are we going to make it through this time? And I think we'll make it through. I think a lot of us will make it. I hope a lot of us will make it through. And But there's there's some common sense that can really help you, help carry you through these times. And real food is one of those things that is always going to hit home. And today in the talk, I really want to get in on the gut stuff and what role the gut can play. And while we are talking about these weird times where there's stuff, inflammatory stuff going on in the world, this is more than that. This is about being human. Yeah. Really understanding how we move through our days and how we feel at the end of the day, during the day, through this whole thing. It's about quality of life. It's about quantity of life as well. But when we do have those days, we want those days to count. We don't want to be doubled over in pain or having to nap all day long because it's just too hard to get through the day. And the gut really does play that ground zero role. So I've got, shall I start the slideshow? Yeah, and, and I think you and I, we could have a whole conversation. I love that idea around outsourcing versus insourcing. I mean, there's, I've read many articles and it's been pretty obvious. And even talking to uh, Danny Vitalis when we did the whole community immunity series, which you were a part of, um, you know, there's so many systems. So, you know, Daniel had said, he's like, you know, when, when we know, all of us have been saying in the back of our, 
her in the back of her head, like, you know, our way of life isn't really sustainable. And, and, it, and if you truly believe that, that means at some point it's got to stop, right? There has to be a shift. There has to be a change. And kind of like how we're talking about with our health, you know, on that broader scale, like we have so many systems set up that aren't actually truly sustainable. We've outsourced so much and there's been so much conversation around like, oh, supply chains, like, wow, manufacturing, <laughs> like, wow, you know, here's something we didn't thought of. Uh, we just kind of went with the quick, we went with the easy, we went with the cheap. And now it's kind of staring us back in the face, kind of on that macro level. But I love how you're bringing it to also that personal individual level. Where have I outsourced uh, my, my responsibility to take care of myself? Or have I outsourced the knowledge and wisdom that it takes to take care of myself? Or have I outsourced my food preparation? And, you know, when I talk about, you know, shifting that, this is the place to start. This is ground zero. This conversation is in sourcing, right? Beginning with those things that are just so close to us, like, okay, preparing food, growing food, you know, understanding how my body works, uh, you know, doesn't have to be on this crazy scientific level. I love how you phrased it, common sense. There's basic knowledge, basic wisdom that, you know, can, we can escape all the kind of medical scientific jargon, not that that doesn't have a place, that has a place for certain people, but for you and I, and for those that are watching, let's bring it back to that ground zero, that basic level, the common sense, uh, you know, the, the folk wisdom, the folk medicine, the understanding of, of cultures and people. And uh, yeah, I, I really see that the, that's the role that, that you're playing. So I'm, I'm excited to get in and <laughs> let's, uh, whenever you're ready, you go ahead and just open up uh, your, your slideshow and we'll, we'll, we'll get right into it um, awesome. and then folks can uh, type in their comments their questions and again uh, give give this a like give it a share and uh, let's get this knowledge out there thanks Luca yeah we're gonna wake up the inner grandma bum, bum, bum. all right I'm gonna start with my slideshow there we go we've got it up and then we're gonna start it I think you should be able to see it yeah yes absolutely right yeah. on. okay well this is this is the first time I'm doing something like this so I'm super excited thank you for asking me to come and chat so yeah, we're talking about the gut as ground zero and the ground zero being the ground zero of all the things, looking after your own health, the health of those who sit at your table and share meals with you, your mental health, your emotional resiliency, how you're going to move through your days. And really, when you start looking after your gut, this is the secret to feeling real good. It doesn't matter if you have currently some health things on the go. It doesn't matter if you have a family line of, say, heart disease that runs in the family that you want to protect against developing in yourself. It doesn't matter if you're looking after elders or young ones in your care that you want to make sure they have the nourishment they need to get through whatever stage they're at. It doesn't matter. It's all the same information for everybody. Looking after your gut is that one single common piece that is applicable to all humans, regardless if you're looking to prevent or move through a chronic disease with better ease, or if you're nourishing somebody that you love and care for. The gut is really that ground zero. So we're gonna get into it. I'm gonna start with a really super sobering statistic. Don't get so sad, but just to bring it all home. First of all, 44, this is a statistic from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Fairly recent, came out in December last year. Super interesting. There's a lot of noise in my background. Everyone's in the house. We, like, sorry if there's a dog barking and coughing. No, we, we can't hear it. We're right here, oh, we're focused. And, and this, I mean, this statistic, like that should be shocking. This, this is really what we should be addressing. I know. Okay, but wait, wait till you hear this. Okay, so the stat that I first read, it was in Alberta Views magazine. Great magazine, by the way. Uh, Calgarian, who's the editor of it. Yay! Uh, Bonesian, no less. 44% of Canadians over the age of 20 have at least one chronic health condition diagnosis. So before you read anymore, first, that's like half of our adult population in Canada. Almost half. Have at least one. Not, not just one, but maybe two or three or four. Okay. First thing. Okay. So also, what? And why is that okay? But more than that, when I went to go digging to find out the information behind this statistic, I wanted to know a little bit more. What does that mean? What is the implication of this? And when I did the research, the number of 44% is only 44% of Canadian adults that have at least one chronic health condition of the top 10 most common ones. Oh, wow. So number 11 to 74, 
they're not represented in that 44%. Wow. So first things first, I just want to underline the what the bleep <laughs> sentiment that when you read this stat, how is this okay? Who has allowed this? Why is this something that nobody is sounding an alarm on? And boy, oh boy, I'm going to sound the alarm, honey pies. Chronic health conditions, what does that mean? Well, it means something that's taken a while for it to show up and it kind of creeps up bit by bit by bit and starts to impact your days and how you move through your days, your quality of life. It can impact different things as well, like sleep or digestion or mood stuff. It can also be really obvious things like cardiovascular disease or cancer, those types of things. So when we're talking about over half of our adult, almost half of our adult population has at least one of the top 10 most common chronic disease diagnoses, it's time to do something about it. I'm not okay with this number. So let's get into it. So we're going to start with a story about this little kiddo. Oh, come on. Oh, what a cutie. What a cutie. Oh, I sure was. That was my dad asking me. My dad took my, that photo of me and he said, could you stop being so silly? Because I always made funny faces. And so that was me trying to be serious. <laughs> I remember that day too. Luca, I'm so glad your playful side, you know, <laughs> has not been tamed. <laughs> oh, child number three or four, you got to be loud to be noticed. <laughs> anyway, this is me. This is 11 year old Luca. And it was shortly thereafter that stuff started to show up for me. So age of 12 I was actually anorexic. <laughs> well, eh, I mean, that's a whole other story, but let's not get into it. Age of 13, I get my first period and my menstrual cycle stops me at least one or two days a month in so much pain. I'm on prescription medication and even that can barely touch it. I have to take one or two days off every month for the next 15 years of my life. Get to the age of 18 and I have carpal tunnel syndrome where my hands go numb. Get to the age of 20 and I start having migraines where I black out. Huh. Age of 22, diagnosis in one 20 minute session with a psychologist, I got five diagnoses, P PTSD, bipolar, OCD, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, and there was another one I can't even remember. So start medication for that and start having a bit of an easier time. I woke up uh, feeling like there was a purple praying mantis coming out of my chest. It was terrifying and it was awful and it was situational based on a really stressful work environment of which I got out of pretty quickly and helped rectify some of those things. But move along and I have a gastric ulcer at, in my late 20s, 28, uh, and then uh, have my kiddo at the age of 32, get into the next slide about that age, then that one on the right shows up in my life, super cutie, Eliza, and as she starts to age, I have a little bit more of stuff showing up. So now uh, I have chronic pain showing up that is starting to really limit in the age of 40. I start talking about knee replacement surgery with my husband because going upstairs is getting to be too difficult. My chronic pain levels in my hands prevented me from being able to prepare the foods I was making in my work life. I was making lunches for kids at that point in my life and I was having a hard time holding the knife because I had so much chronic pain. It was waking me up in the night and all of these things, you know, one thing after another fertility issues thrown in there, depression as part of the picture, absolutely, and anxiety throughout all of these years. Now this kid shows up and she is the age of, she's probably about three there, but the age of six, she got the diagnosis of 12 cavities in a really short amount of time, in about six month span of time, from none to 12. And when they find that many in that short of a time, they go in and do day surgery, P.S., which is terrifying, but hooray for modern medicine and the dentist who did this work, because now she had a pirate tooth, which she thought was the coolest thing in the world. But I was left wondering, 12 cavities in six months, what is going on? This is not okay. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the school she was at, somebody at the school shared with me the book Nourishing Traditions. And that sort of opened the door for me, was uh, going into the Weston Price Foundation, uh, which is an organization that was started up by a dentist who was noticing the health of the teeth of the children in his care and how it was starting to deteriorate in the age that corresponded with packaged foods coming to the table. And he would do some travel as he got later on in his practice and he would check the teeth of kids in other places of the world where they were still eating their traditional diets and he would see that their teeth were perfectly fine. Why were the teeth in America starting to rot with the advent of all of these foods and a lot of affluence, why were those teeth rotting? And the teeth of those who are eating 
the traditional foods diet of real food from scratch. What's happening? And tying those two things together. So this opened up yet another door for me to understand that power of food. So it was through my kiddo. Do they not bring us gifts all the time? I will never be able to repay her for the gifts she brings. But the, she started that meandering road for me to try to put pieces in place and do my own sleuthing to understand again how much I could insource some of that work to support her to be able to grow up so she wouldn't have dentures at the age of 14. P.S. She's now 15. She hasn't had a cavity since those 12 that showed up when she was six. Mm -hmm. So we're doing something right. Like mm. yeah, good work. So it takes a lot of work. It's not, for the, it's not for the faint of heart, but through all of this work and through understanding and discovering things for my kiddo, I started to see some of those benefits myself. And I've continued on this whole real food thing because I've seen such benefits for me. And over the years, since introducing some of the things I did initially for Eliza, but then putting it in for myself. Some of those main points were, and this is all from the Western Price Foundation, was about improving the quality of foods. So understanding that if you source foods from certain ways that animals are raised or plants are grown or harvested or uh, packaged or prepared, that can make a difference. Reducing your reliance on packaged foods and really going to from scratch. If you would have asked me 10 years ago if I did from scratch, I would say, yeah, I make butter chicken from scratch. I open a packet and throw in a can of tomatoes and that is from scratch, right? And I shredded a chicken from Superstore because I needed protein in there. It was already roasted and I like, that's from scratch, right? Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. So understanding a little bit deeper, and it was a, it was a very long journey. It was at, I mean, I've been at this now for at least 10 years. But adding in fermented foods is another piece that we've added in that whole scenario. And I think that was probably the biggest needle mover for me. And really focusing on those gut nourishing foods. And more than this, simplifying. Yeah. Simplifying the delivery of foods to our mouths not having it so complicated, not thinking I had to match what was happening on Food Network. It was not a battle. It was not a war to be won. It was not something that was so hard to attain. It was rather simple and it didn't have to be complicated. And there were some tricks that I learned along the way and some hacks that are now serving me well. It's a long journey and it's not, like I say, it's not for the faint of heart, but if you really want to talk about improving your quality of life and at the end of the day, feeling real good, ah, then real food is where you start. And you can do that specifically pinpointing and nourishing and supporting that ground zero at the gut level. Yeah, totally. I love it. And, you know, I've been in, into nutrition for a long time. My journey was a little bit different where I turned life upside down, like, you know, stopped doing this, started doing that, like 110%. And uh, I've come to this exact same approach, seeing it being so much more successful, exactly what you say. So improving quality of foods, my wording for that is upgrade, right? It's like, yeah. don't stop eating, you know, what you're used to eating and want to eat, just upgrade it, right? Like, it's that whole like journey of bread. You go from wonder bread to white bread to whole wheat bread to, you know, sprouted bread to sourdough bread. You, you know, you take your regular butter and you go to grass fed butter. You take, you know, it's, it's that just upgrade and then the adding in. And as you start getting in the good stuff, the body goes like, oh, wow, right? You begin to feel the difference. You see the difference. And then the choices become really obvious. And it's no longer like, oh, you better not have this or you shouldn't do that. It's, it's upgrading and it's adding in. Yeah. And then the secret of it is the more you do this kind of stuff, the more you, I sort of have a saying, well, it's not my saying, this is Monica Carrado, who's a gal out of the States. She's so great. She'll, she'll say, okay, so when it's too much, you bless it and you get on with it because honestly, it's just a meal. And tomorrow you have the chance to do it again. So it's all about balance. It really is about balance and bless and get on with it. And simplifying is a big piece of that too, right? For sure. Okay. So next up there is, of course, this is the very famous quote that everybody uses because it's true all disease begins in the gut some guy 2000 years ago his name was hippocrates i think we were homies at a time but um all disease begins in the gut that was his saying and here we are in 2020 with 2020 vision <laughs> just kidding <laughs> but we're able to see that this is totally the truth all disease really does begin in the gut 
this is why the gut is ground zero. You'll understand a little bit more as we dive into some of these slides and some of these concepts of why the gut is ground zero and how the majority of the work for all, you know, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one client work and the, everyone gets a gut piece, everyone. It is the common thread, whether you're coming to me with nervous system ailments, whether you have skin issues, fertility issues, or gut issues like IBS or IBD or constipation or histamine issues, it doesn't matter. What's in common with all of these complaints is the gut. Yeah. And those complaints that we have are just the way your body sends out signals and is talking to you, right? Like when I go back to the list of things that I had to struggle through, so all of the mood stuff, all of the painful periods, all of the reliance on some medications to get me through my days. And I was grateful for that medication at the time, but the medication was not fixing the issue. Getting to the root cause of why I had those terrible monthly pains, why I had mood stuff, was something was not right at my gut. So going in and supporting that gut piece to really get at the root of what was behind all of those signals that my body was sending saying, oh, hey, hi, something's up, could you please fix it? The mood stuff, oh, hey, hi, something's off, can you please fix it? Um, all of these different pieces are ways that your body is letting you know that something's up. So I encourage you to really sit for a second and think, what kind of signals is your body sending you? And yeah. just keep that in mind as we're going through this because it's, it's gonna start to make a little bit more sense as we dive into it. Yeah, I've got an intuitive eating course where I go into that, you know, learning the language of your body. Like, how does your body speak? It's it literally speaking to you all the time. We just need to learn its languaging and learn how to respond. And yeah. Yeah, you have to listen. I call it fierce listening. Like really listen only to hear and not to interpret, but to first off say, oh, hey, hi, whoa, what, what's that you're saying? Something's up? Oh, okay. Yeah. And then to to know that your body's always choosing also to make it through the day as best it can. Your body is not against you. You guys are a team, P.S. It irks me sometimes when, <laughs> when and it, it's not that the act of people saying this is what irks me, is that the fact that we think that our body is mad at us. It, we're still coming out of this place of like, we're at war with ourselves or there is, our body is letting us down. Oh, for God's sake. Your body is always working for you and is always letting you know when she needs help with something somewhere. So yeah, it's not a war. Amazing. We need to we need to shift that talk. Yeah, I love that. Uh, it was remember it was a number of years ago that uh, Yaro had given me that perspective because uh, he was talking with with a young woman who was having issues with her skin, right? And she was you know naturally it's on her face and this is this an area. It was like you start that starts to come up and it can cause all kinds of emotions. And for her, it was a lot of like kind of anger and resentment. She's like, oh, I keep dealing with all these like, you know, skin issues on my face. And, and you're all, you know, it's first thing. It's like, you got, you got to like, thank your, your skin. Like, look at the work it's doing, right? It's trying to show you something and, and it's working so well. And this is just kind of a, this is just the symptoms. Of yeah. That. And, and keep That's going. brilliant. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's like a, it's like a love note. <laughs> I mean, shrouded in what feels like not so awesome, but it is a love tap. It's a, it's a little, hey, hi, a little memo, something's up. Can you please take a peek at things? And skin stuff for sure falls under gut as ground zero stuff. Yeah. But let's get into it. So I love this. The first thing, gums to bum. This is a, a Terry Willard, Yara's yeah. dad. So Terry says this, of course, calls it gums to bum. That's your whole digestive tract. And really gums to the old bum there, down there. That whole thing is your gut. But today we're really focusing on your intestinal tract. So your intestinal tract has three layers. This is kind of a gut 101 class, if you will. So there's three layers. The first layer is your intestinal wall, which is your cellular matrix. And it's one cell thick, which I think is remarkable. Um, and that one cell has those cells hang on together. This was Dr. Andrea Bobrun from Integra here in Calgary, who talked about it. And I thought this makes so much sense. The cells are hanging on like this and they're nice and tight, hopefully hanging on to each other. The junctions should be tight. When these are tight, this cell level makes a couple of things. One of which is some enzymes that you need to break down histamines, that you need to break down carbohydrates, that you need to break down lactose, that you need to finish breaking other foods down, what have you. There's also in this first layer lives a secondary layer and this is your mucosal barrier. 
So if you take your tongue and you run it inside along the inside of your cheek and it's kind of sloppy and wet and gooey, that's exactly the same thing that's happening in your gut. You've got that mucosal barrier as a secondary layer living right on top of the skin. On top of that lives that third layer and that third layer is your microbiome. And so that microbiome, everyone has it and it's this super relatively newly discovered thing that has actually been there for a long time and it's just a long lost forgotten organ for all intents and purposes. But this microbiome has such a big part to play in so many different facets of how the body functions in your metabolic function and in the function of your nervous system and your gut as well and digestion. It's got a really big role to play in a lot of things. So your microbiome, on average, everybody has four to six pounds in your gut at all times, which is tremendous to me. Like, that's amazing. That's like, think of four to six pounds of butter, blocks of butter. That's how much is in your gut. Wow. Whoa! That's amazing. And it's always replenishing. So you're letting some go every time you go to the bathroom, but 60% of your poop is actually bacteria. So you're having to turn that over all the time. So that's turned over by the foods that you eat, by what's happening at the gut level and the ways that you're interacting with your environment, what kinds of cleaners you've got, your food choices, how they're prepared. There's a lot that has a say in what's happening at the microbiome. And really there's a microbiome everywhere in your body. Like we are outnumbered 10 bacterial cells for every one human cell. So you're basically a bag of bugs walking around, which is amazing. But if you think about it, so, you know, there's 10 bacterial cells for every one human cell. You might then ask, okay, well, how come I can't see them? Well, a bacteria is the size of a pin and the human cell is the size of a three-story mansion. So you're not going to see them. Bacteria is super teeny tiny, but they're playing a really important role in digestion. They make serotonin at the gut level, along with some nervous cells and some endocrine cells that are lining your gut. Serotonin is that feel good chemical that you need for balanced moods. You need serotonin as the precursor for that hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is what you need for proper sleep at night. So there's a lot of different roles that the microbiome will play. It'll break down some of the foods for you. It will free up some of the vitamins and minerals that you need from your foods. There's there's so much, it turns cancer markers on and cancer markers off at the cellular level. It teaches your immune system, these are my cells and these are not my cells. So we're just really now in the last 20 years or so uncovering how much the microbiome has a, a role to play in our everyday function and our overall health. And we're really just like, it's like an iceberg. We've only done the top, Lord knows, seven or eight times more is buried under sea and how much bigger it is. Like, it's remarkable how little we know about it. And this is going to be such a continuing, super interesting spot to dive into. Yeah. So we've got those three layers. You got the cells, the mucus, and then the microbiome. And those three work together to kind of be that Fort Knox and to keep the outside world out and the inside world in because your, your gut is really, you're a donut. And your digestive tract is the inside of the donut, right? And the rest of your body is the doughy part of the donut, especially if you're like me. And <laughs> that digestive tract is considered, the inside hole of the donut is the outside world. So your intestinal tract and your mucosal barrier and that microbiome are the Fort Knox to keep the inside world in and keep the outside world out if that makes sense. So when there are troubles at the gut lining, and one of those things that can be is leaky gut. Leaky gut is when those junctions between the cells start to come apart. There's a lot of things that can contribute to that. I'll get to that in a second. When the cells start to come apart, you have a patchy way of making that mucosal barrier. The pH changes as well. Now that starts to impact the microbiome. And now you've reduced diversity. You've done a couple of other things, but now, You've opened the doors, whips. It's not so Fort Knox anymore. Uh oh, what happens? Well, stuff's gonna come through that shouldn't typically be allowed to come through. But it's still not the end of the world because you are a marvelous thing. Marvelous thing because you have a backup crew. When something comes through that's not supposed to, your immune system is living right there. 70% of it lives in your gut and it's intercepting these things coming through and it's getting rid of them and making sure that it doesn't create problems for you. So your backup crew ends up being kind of your immune system and your liver working together 
to help protect and become the next level of Fort Knox, if you will, if that first layer of defense is starting to have troubles. But really, the biggest puzzle piece of it all right now is the microbiome. And I know for me, my own personal work that I've done for my own personal health, and I've really seen a major, major reduction in my reliance on medications and in how I'm moving through the day. My brain fog and my mood stuff has completely lifted, except sometimes it still gets the better of me because we're in lockdown, but let's not talk about it. Uh, but the biggest piece of all of this is the microbiome. And like I say, it's that new piece that's only shown, we're just starting to see the importance of it and the, the role that it plays in these last number of years. And we're only going to see more and more. And this is where it's the most exciting. So we're gonna get into the microbiome in a second. Now, why is the gut ground zero? It is, like I say, that donut, right? And it's the outside world. And the rest of you on the other side of that intestinal lining is the inside world. And this is where you most closely interact with the outside world. And it's where you're supposed to most closely interact with the outside world. 70% of that immune system lives in the gut. And your immune system is the guy that takes an inform. It's a learning organ. It's a sensory organ. It takes information from your environment that's being introduced through foods, through inhalation, through interactions with the microbiota that's living in the environment where you are. Like, it's taking that information and it's relaying it through this thing called the vagus nerve and it's sending it up to the brain so that the brain can know what's going on because the brain's your central computer and it wants information to know what's happening. So your immune system is always sending information up to the brain to let it know what's happening. Is there something coming in? Do we have an invader? Is there a problem in the Fort Knox lining? And that's part of why the gut is ground zero, because that's the first place of alarm. And that is the root cause behind the majority of chronic diseases. It's that immune system that is mounting what we call an inflammatory reaction. So if I'm ta I talk a lot about inflammation all the time. And it's because, you know, this type of chronic low-grade inflammation is what's at the root of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mood stuff, anxiety stuff, um, the degenerative diseases like ALS, Parkinson's, uh, the stuff like chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, they all have an inflammatory component to this. If we're looking into things like ADHD and um, uh, even dyslexia, interestingly enough, has an inflammatory component to it. Stuff like the autoimmune disorders has low-grade chronic inflammation at the root of it all. But why? Well, your immune system mounts that inflammatory reaction as a protective mechanism because she wants you to live. For God's sake, inflammation is your body responding to the problem. It's the fire department coming to put the fire out and putting all of its tools in place to help put out the fire. And it is that immune system that's going to do that response to anything it perceives as an irritant. Well, what's an irritant? Foods you haven't properly digested. Food-like substances that you ate that now contributed to pushing the junctions between the cells apart. So things like emulsifiers and preservatives in some of our packaged foods, they're the biggest defenders of this. They will contribute to pushing the cells apart. And they are now at that ground zero level creating that inflammatory reaction right there at the gut lining. And now this has repercussions outwards. Because this inflammatory reaction now ties up your immune system, sends a message to the brain that we're under attack, and now your body's moving through the world as if everything is awful and terrible and it needs to protect you. Well, I don't know if it, tell, it says that everything is awful and terrible, but it says there's a problem, breach in, at level zero, can we please attend to this? And so now your immune system comes in to help put things in place to keep you safe and to help continue to keep the outside world out and the inside world in. And again, your immune system really is that sensory and a super learning organ that's always taking in information from the outside world and your environment in order to understand what's happening so as to better mitigate and figure out what can be its plan of action. Not plan of attack, plan of action, because it's not a war, guys. Okay, I am talking a little bit warlike. But getting into, okay, so that's nice. Now that you get what the gut is and sort of the different components of it and why the immune system and that inflammatory reaction is part of it, why well, still don't get it? Why is the gut ground zero? 
for all of the things. Well, let's get into it. So mood disorders, we'll start first because that one I know very well. When you have a hard time with your microbiome at that gut level, you have a hard time making serotonin. And we make it out of a molecule called tryptophan. Tryptophan is an amino acid, actually. It's a protein, smallest building block of protein. You'll find it in all meats. You'll find it in a lot of nuts and seeds and dairy products. You know, the whole turkey thing where everybody has a nap after turkey dinner at Thanksgiving, totally tied to tryptophan, which is the funny story that everybody knows. But that tryptophan is converted into serotonin by the microbiome, so the bugs of your gut, in conjunction with cells that line your intestinal tract. So mood disorders, if you can't get serotonin to work properly in the brain or the receptors to take it up, you're having a hard time with something at the gut level. Oh, anybody with mood disorders would be well served to look after the gut. Autoimmune conditions. Well, autoimmune conditions is when your immune system starts to attack your own cells. Your immune system is instructed or taught by your microbiome. Listen, these are my cells, don't touch. These are something foreign, can you please get rid of this? And when somebody has an autoimmune condition, certain cells, they start to not see them as self. There's this protein marker that's on the cells, there's a self and non-self. So, and the immune system labels some of those cells. Well, they start to not be able to label, like if you have, say, Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition, one of the most common ones. It's where your own immune system starts to attack your own thyroid. Well, that's because your microbiome hasn't been able to teach your immune system, hey, these thyroid cells, these are mine, don't touch. And now your immune system thinks that they're an outside invader, so it starts to attack it. Oh, whoops. That is all due to gut stuff and the microbiome specifically. So anybody with any type of autoimmune condition would be well served to look after the gut. Ground zero is where it started, yeah honey. Skin troubles, we were talking about this earlier. So when you're talking about any type of eruptions on the skin, be it acne, be it eczema, hives, hives are histamine mediated, so is eczema. Psoriasis is an autoimmune condition. When there are any type of histamine stuff or skin stuff, this is all mimicking some of the stuff that's happening at the gut level. When your gut and your liver cannot properly move waste out, your skin becomes an elimination organ. And your body is actively promoting elimination through your skin, which is wonderful. Good work, body, thank you so much. So sorry it's burning me on the way out, but yay, it's getting it out of your body. The only way it can, because the other ways are not working very well. So typically looking at the gut at that stage will do some brilliant work to help improve and take the weight off so that your skin doesn't have to be that elimination organ of moving stuff out. Histamine issues, it's all gut. Wow, big part of it is gut. So you make an enzyme at the gut level in those cells at the intestinal lining that breaks down histamines coming in through food. Histamines are never the issue. It's getting rid of histamines that's the issue. You need histamines for so many different processes in the body. Histamines, uh, you have histamine receptors on every single cell of the body. Like you're supposed to use and have histamines in your diet and in your day-to-day -day operation. But when you're done with them, you're supposed to be able to move them out. People who have histamine issues can't move the spent histamines out. And that's where the problem lies. One of the ways that this shows up is that you can't make an enzyme at the gut level that breaks down histamines coming in through foods. So people who have a hard time with bone broth or with fermented foods, you're having issues at the gut level that you can't make that enzyme to break down the spent histamine or the histamines from food. That's what I had. Thyroid stuff, whenever there's a thyroid issue, you need to look at the gut. It's usually one of the first organs to get out of balance when there's a gut issue. And part of it is the thyroid is just so closely involved with health at the gut lining, but the thyroid also makes some of those, along with the liver, makes some conversions of plant versions of vitamins into the animal versions of vitamins, specifically that vitamin A that we need for Fort Knox and that mucosal barrier to be strong. So when there's a thyroid issue, I guarantee you there's a gut issue going on that we need to address as well. When the thyroid's out, every other organ in that system, including your adrenals, are going to get off kilter. And now you're going to have some adrenal imbalances. Addressing the gut will reduce so much of what's contributing to those adrenal imbalances. The obvious ones, the GI trouble, like constipation, diarrhea, gas, or those diagnoses like IBS, IBD, Crohn's, colitis, celiac, all of those things. Well, that's obviously happening in the gut. 
it's ground zero quite clearly there. Stuff like joint pain. When you start to improve gut health, you start to reduce how much stuff you're not able to digest. That's actually what sometimes what's behind gut, uh, sorry, joint pain. Your body is depositing stuff it can't quite get rid of or break down or doesn't recognize as nutrients. And it's shoving it in nooks and crannies of the body in places it doesn't deem necessary. And joint pain is one of those ways. So when we improve what's happening at the gut and we improve how you're better able to break foods down, that starts to see a relief and it reduces the impact on the gut. And now we start to see the repercussions reverberating out and we reduce those symptoms that are associated with joint pain. Yeah. Brain fog. Away from the core, away from those like vital organs, right out to the extremities. How is that not your body choosing for you to live, right? Yeah. I know, we are truly remarkable, remarkable beings. The brain fog, the sleep troubles, you need to be able to take foods down and break them down into nutrients in order to utilize those nutrients in different processes of the body. Sleep troubles, brain fog, are often related to somebody who can't properly take foods and break them down. When you're not able to digest, you're now further impacting that inflammation at the ground zero there at the gut. So while I talk about looking after the intestinal tract, now we need to start also talking about how to improve digestion as part of this. Low energy, low energy is actually one of the symptoms of low grade chronic inflammation. When you start to reduce the inflammation that's happening at the gut, you start to improve energy levels. It's one of the pieces that starts to repair itself if we give the body the tools because it's always aiming to be well. Any kind of nervous system stuff, um, that gut, your second gut, what is it? hundred, I wrote it down, hundred million nerve cells that line your intestinal tract. Your gut is really the second brain. So if anything's happening at the gut, you are feeling it in the brain. IBS and IBD, do you know that uh, the medications that they prescribe for both of those are anti-anxiety and anti-depression medications? To address the gut stuff, what? yeah because they are happen that's how it happens in the brain it shows up as anxiety in the gut it shows up as diarrhea in the brain it shows up as depression so it will now show up in the gut as constipation so it's so interesting to me how those are so obviously linked any type of neurodegenerative stuff like parkinson's alzheimer's they're now wondering if these are not kind of like a type 3 diabetes that is involving blood balance, blood sugar balancing issues, and inflammatory things from the foods we've eaten for many, many years. Canola oil is one of the biggest culprits behind this epidemic of Alzheimer's. It's one of the biggest contributors to this outbreak of what seems to be 44% of adults 20 and over in Canada. Like it's one of the top 10 most common chronic health conditions. Well, for God's sake, people, first things first, get rid of the canola. Even if it's cold pressed, and if you've got good cold pressed, good stuff, then use it on a rare occasion. Uh, yeah, it's delicious, but only use it on rare occasions. Anyway, metabolic issues, reproductive cavities. I was talking about those 12 cavities. That's an indication of microbiome in the mouth that is off balance. So when your body is sending you some of these signals, when she is talking to you, what kinds of things is she saying? And can we start to, instead of getting mad at our body or thinking that we need to quiet those symptoms, what's our body trying to tell us? Let's really listen to what those signals are. And then let's be proactive about insourcing some of those practical things that we can tend to. And looking after the gut is really going to be place number one. And it's the one thing that's common for anybody uh, with any type of health complaint that they've got on the go, whether it's cardiovascular, asthma, COPD, cancer, it doesn't matter, all of these things. This, this slide was just absolutely incredible, like mind blowing really, like to go through condition after condition after condition and, and bring it all around to the gut. It's all gut. Yeah, like bravo, amazing, thank oh, you. Oh, thanks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I have two questions for you. First one, is your body talking to you? Is she speaking in whispers or maybe she's using her outside voice? <laughs> and think about it, like really truly think about it. I remember for 25 years thinking how I had such a defective body and why was I 95 years old in a 27 year old's body? 
And I remember thinking I got so shortchanged in my life, similar to the story you're talking about Riaro with the woman who had skin troubles on her face. I felt like it was super life limiting and I couldn't, you know, I'm at the stage where I broke my knee a number of years ago and I can't join my family on bicycles. And I think it's so easy for me in this current day and age to go, well, that's not fair and it's not right. And how come me? Yeah, absolutely. That is part of the grieving process. Sure. I don't feel comfortable sitting in that. What if I take a 180 and I often share this with clients. What if you see it this way, you take a step back and you walk around to the other position and you come at it from a 180 degree perspective difference. What if instead that your body is mad at you or is trying to limit you or you deserve this? What if your body is actually talking to you? What if your body was actually asking for a change? And every time I talk about this, I have hairs that raise and if I hadn't have had that epiphany where I needed to change my relationship to my own body and take that step out, come back 180 and look at it from the other point of view, I would probably not be as well as I am. I would probably be angry at the world, which would certainly not serve anybody and even less myself and even less than that, my sweet kiddo. So I'm going to ask you, is your body talking to you? And is she using whispers or is she using her outside voice? <laughs> okay, that's nice. But now what do we do, Luca? Okay, so let's start because let's be practical. First off, tell jokes. Second off, get into one of the three things you can do. We're just starting with some of the three things because I have a full program actually that we're actually launching next week. We're doing a two week gut loving crash course. It's a whole group online coaching thing that I'm starting on Monday. We'll talk about that maybe at the end, but these are some of the places you can start today. First things first, if you're eating grains or nuts or beans or seeds or legumes, you can start by choosing sprouted so, uh, or sourdough. I would add sourdough in that list. The reason is these grains that we're eating, whole grains, we're told for such a long time to eat whole grains. They're so healthy for you. They're full of B vitamins, blah, blah, the fiber, yada, yada. Great, except whips. That's what I was feeding my kid before she had her 12 cavities. I was feeding her whole grains because I'm a good mom. And so these whole grains, what they end up doing, they shut down your digestion, first of all. And second of all, they steal your minerals from your body. Where do you store your minerals? Your teeth and your bones. If you do that simple switch of just going to a sprouted version of brown rice instead of regular brown rice, if you do the simple switch of buying a true sourdough bread, you'll know it's true sourdough because yeast is not on the ingredients, you go to a true sourdough in that fermentation process of making the sourdough bread, the active compounds, the probiotics that are in there, the microbiome and the yeast, the microbiota, whatever, and yeast that are in there are breaking down the grains and turning off the phytic acid, which steals your minerals and the enzyme inhibitors so that it doesn't shut down your digestion. So it's a simple first step. Look for sprouted nuts and beans in the coolers of some health food stores. I know the light seller has some stuff as well. Do you guys have sprouted nuts at all? We got uh, all the raw nuts, so which you can sprout, ferment, roast, whatever you want to do with. We have a sprouted almond butter. Yeah. See, which is amazing. So when, if you're consuming a lot of whole grains or a lot of, if you're a regular almond butter person, if you go the sprouted route, now you're actually going to be supporting your own digestive fire instead of shutting it down. Going, it, it, having that sprouted version will just support the whole digestive process and help maintain your mineral stores so you don't have to lose them. Yeah, good work. The second piece, you can also learn how to sprout yourself, PS, which I'll do a class at some point. The second piece is you can eat real food. And that sounds like a, oh yeah, whatever, Luca, roll your eyes. Go for it, I don't care. Do you know that eating real food will be 80% of the work? Eating real food feels like something ethereal that you can't reach. Do you wanna know why? Because you're disconnected from it. Why don't you start working at what it looks like? Why don't you start asking yourself, well, geez, what is real food? And you can start with this, what would your grandmother have eaten? And I'm not saying like, my grandmother? I was talking to my uncle a couple of months ago and I said, what did grandma like to make? And he said, oh my God, her dinners were awful. It was like boiled meat and boiled vegetables to the point where you put it on your tongue and it would dissolve. Like it was just so overboiled. The salt and pepper were the only flavors. Don't tell me you want to cook like my mom. I was like, well, maybe I don't want to cook as much as she did, but I'll, 
I'll leave the vegetables so you can still tell they're vegetables. <laughs> but eating real food is one of those secrets. And that when you're eating real food and slowing down your reliance on packaged foods, you're omitting a lot of the foods that promote inflammation. You're omitting a lot of those foods that will contribute to the junctions at that gut level coming apart. So you're reducing those things that are helping create the leaky gut scenario. When you eat real food, you're also providing your body with the nutrients so that it can work really well. You know, people are always caught on calories when you first come around to real food and they're like, but I'm going to drink a five calorie in so diet soda pop. Okay, so I want you, if you're going to race, if you're going to run a race and you need, I don't know, 30 calories to run the amount of race, are you going to drink 30 calories of Diet Coke or are you going to consume 30 calories of broccoli? Which one is going to better fuel that race to use those 30 calories? So going to real food is going to provide your body with some of those nutrients you need for everyday function. So I'll just add to that in terms of the, the real food, like it, it happens exactly like you're saying, getting off of artificial to natural, you know, uh, package to, you know, homemade, this kind of thing. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, organic, right? So, you know, how was it grown? Think about, think about that. Uh, I'm not sure if you're going to get into this or maybe it's too much of a rabbit hole, but, you know, Zach Bush and Never. others <laughs> talking about glyphosate, you know, and, and food that's grown on this mass industrial scale uh, is actually very damaged to the microbiome, very damaging to the, uh, the gut lining. So think about real food in that way. The other thing I would invite you to think about real food, that shift, again, that upgrade is think about genetics, think about heirloom. And I always like to use the example of, of, of tomatoes, right? And many of us have already made that progress, you know, from the, the grocery store, just kind of average conventional greenhouse grown kind of sort of looks like a tomato. Sure, I'll chop it up and throw it in a salad or put it on my burger. But, you know, making that shift to organic, to uh, biodynamic, you know, farmer's market, you know, like where it's, it's literally real food uh, and it's in the genetics and it's, in, and it's how it's grown and it's in it's that journey, that upgrade uh, continually with all our foods. How can we get to that more real state? Yeah, and further to that point, so I'm glad you bring this up, food is information. Food is information to your immune system. Food is information to your body. Yeah, it's nourishment. Yeah, it's B6 and protein and fats. Yeah, for sure. But more than that, it's information. What kind of information are you sending? What kind of information are you telling your body? If your diet relies on a lot of things that have received a lot of chemicals sprayed on it or needed uh, a, a session of Roundup to desiccate it all, to bring it to harvest, to make the bread that you bought, um, are those types of things, what kind of information is that sending to the body? And are, is that contributing to the message the brain is getting that we're on fire, we're on fire? Are our brains on fire because actually the land is on fire because of the crap that we're doing to it because we're not being responsible stewards of the land. Is yeah. that part of it? So eating real food, the, like, and that's part of what I get into with my work in, in this reboot thing that I'm doing. It's called the Real Food Redux. We're, we've already covered some of this in the program, but, and I'll run it again, but like re, what really is real food? Start trying to figure that piece out and there's like 72 different ways of looking at it and i'm so glad you brought that up because yeah glyphosate is one of the biggest contributors now they're wondering if not actually teflon pans and glyphosate are more behind the leaky gut scenario than gluten yeah it's fascinating not mm -hmm. to say that gluten may not be contributing but let, let me just add on to that idea of like food is information, right? And, and sure, there's, you know, there's vitamins, there's minerals, there's, you know, bio phytochemicals and all this stuff. And, and one can really get nerdy and into the scientific analysis of it. But again, I love this kind of, you know, come back to common sense, come back to simple folkloric wisdom. How, did, how can we tune in? How can we know that? How can we land with that? And again, that's trusting our body, our trusting our body's wisdom and own intelligence and receiving the, the, the clues, you know, like colors, smells, tastes, all of that is how our body can perceive that a food is full of information right? It's coming through in all those different forms. 
And on the layers that we can register, dare I say, and on layers that we don't even know exist or that we can register. There's an innate intelligence that we haven't even tapped into that I don't even know where to start looking. Like how much, how much is going on in our bodies and how our bodies function and how we interact with our environment? Uh, how much of that can, do we not even know where to look to figure out? Yeah. You are most closely interacting with the outside world through this hole. I know you could take it and be dirty. That's not what I mean. Although well, that, um, that also gives information too, but, but well, yeah. really your, your interaction with the outside world is through your digestive tract more than anywhere else in your body. Totally. And, and I'm, I'm witnessing that right now in the beginning of stages of life with my son, who's, you know, mm -hmm. he's almost 10 months and, and what do babies do, right? They go around and they put everything in their mouth, right? They're beginning to explore and their, their body is learning. So not only are they picking up different microbes that are in building that microbiome, but it's, it's information of, about their environment through the mouth and building that intelligence. I love it. He's a smart cookie, that little Aska. Good work. <laughs> well, we all are. I think that's, that's my point. It's, it's part of our journey as, as humans. And I remember it was years ago, I remember listening to this health lecturer. Um, you know, it's like, unfortunately, right, we, we shut kids down, right? It's like, how many times does it take for little Johnny's hand to get slapped where he stops eating dirt? He stops listening to that intuitive call of his body to explore through his mouth. Mm -hmm. it's true it's true and is there there's so much evidence to be that's out there and available to that backs up the concept of letting kids interact with their environment i mean don't sit them in a box of cat litter let's be smart use common sense but you have to interact and to understand what's happening in the world that's where they're going to get a lot of information about where they're growing up and what's happening in the environment around them for sure yeah cool all right so real food yes yeah so that's real food so let's get to number three nourish those three layers of the gut so i've got the three here this is the, your third piece of information on where to start but the first layer for those cells of the intestinal lining the best foods are going to be your meat stock kombu broth for those who prefer to go a vegan route or who want an alternative collagen and gelatin added to drinks can also be really beneficial the lowest histamine of all of these because i do speak quite a bit about histamines in my work meat stock is the lowest in histamines the others tend to be fairly high in histamines so if you really have a super duper compri compromised gut then you need to actually start with meat stock for all of the others there are uh, we've got the, well you have tons of information actually on the youtube channel for the light seller so People want to dive into that there's a video that malcolm and i did a couple years ago that is still available pretty high um number of people watched it which is pretty yeah pretty awesome and the kombu broth which we did in january it's awesome yeah totally and, and just to clarify so uh, maybe you know maybe you don't i know you and i have talked about this you share it a lot you know meat stock versus bone broth you know especially in regards to histamines so are you also saying that kombu broth is that higher in histamines than meat stock as well yeah, kombu broth is actually quite high in histamines and it has to do with the ingredients you're using in it. So you're soaking kombu um, dried seaweed and dried shiitake mushrooms. And the two themselves on their own have a lot of histamines in them. And traditionally, when you make a kombu broth, it's a base for a miso soup. Well, miso tends to be quite high in histamines as well. So I personally cannot handle kombu broth at all. And that's uh, first case, <laughs> like I, I've, I've realized that from my own experimentation that something and done the research afterwards that seaweed is actually quite high in histamines as are shiitake mushrooms. So for somebody who has quite a compromised gut, then you need to start considering doing a meat stock version first and then moving on to as you do some of that early repair so that you can now help the cells come back together so you can better make that enzyme that an enzyme is just a chemical scissor to break down histamines coming in through foods. Once you do that initial work, now you can have the kombu broth, you can have the collagen, you can do the gelatin because now you can make the enzyme. And now you, the foods coming through the digestive tract are not contributing to the rain coming in the rainbow and to the histamine issues. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll just interject just really quickly here. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of skimming it over and, and this is a, a topic that deserves its own conversation because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I mean, 
a lot of people will hear like, oh, fermented foods are great. You know, bone broth is so great. And you start to introduce it. I mean, it's the, it's the rare person. It's, you know, whatever the percentage is, like there's always that one person that goes like, oh, but, you know, I did that. And then, you know, symptoms got worse. And, it, it, you know, like I went the other direction. Whereas, you know, the 99 other percent, like, yeah, awesome. Like ferments, you know, bone broth, it was all good. So if you're that person, um, definitely reach out to Luca. She's got a program for you. You can go down that rabbit hole. Uh, very likely could be a histamine issue. It's, it's, you know, it's about this much of, of information beyond what we're going to get into today. But if that's kind of a thought or a trigger for you, uh, just know that that's a whole other rabbit hole uh, that Luke has got a lot of experience with and, and really does help people sort that out and then move forward in, in the way she's going to keep explaining. Yeah, and actually, so the gut program that I'm launching next week, I have 13 current clients who are actually enrolled in it, and half of us, including me, have histamine issues. And so that's actually something we're going to be keeping in part of the conversation because we'll, part of the whole program that launches next week is we have a full weekly hour where it's in a private group where we do a live Q&A. So we're going to be addressing a lot of those histamine things then. So it might be a really great time for you to jump into starting to understand what's behind some of those histamine issues and what are those pieces that are within your own control and your own power so you can now insource what you need for your body to work better okay so that's level one if we're going to the mucosal barrier for layer two the best foods for that are butter or ghee and both are great for those who can't handle butter then i encourage you to try ghee ghee does not have any lactose or very 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 minute amounts and also doesn't have any um what did I say? Lactose and casein, which is the protein in butter, which sometimes can be problematic for some. So butter and ghee have that vitamin A. It's a good, better, best scenario where conventionally raised butter will have some. Uh, better would be organic butter and best would be butter from cows that are fed and finished on grass. In Canada, our butter that sells between sort of the end of May to October, November, typically will have, especially the earlier butter, will have a lot of that vitamin A in it because it comes with the flush of grass when the cows first get out on the field and when they start to harvest the, the butter and the, the cream from there to make the butter, uh, that's where you'll have a lot of that vitamin A that is really nourishing to the gut lining. Water is also really important. Drink herbal teas, drink water, especially if you're drinking herbal teas that have some diuretic act, then start to up how much water you're drinking. If you're drinking coffee, coffee can be a diuretic as well, so start increasing how much water you've got. And those two together are some of the biggest hitters to how to nourish that secondary layer. Now, if we get into the third layer, your microbiome, there's two things you can do. You can do fermented, well, I guess there's three. There's fermented foods, sometimes appointed probiotic, will help, but it has it, it, the really the only time I would do a pointed therapeutic probiotic is if there's something like SIBO or if there's a histamine issue. Often SIBO and histamines go hand in hand. P.S. Surprise, surprise. But a pointed therapeutic probiotic does some of the early work and then we eventually get you to a point where you're able to tolerate some of those fermented foods. But a fermented food, so I was one of those people who got so sick on fermented foods and I was like, well, but everybody talks about it and why can't I? Well, I'm at the stage where I'm drinking tons of ferments and eating lots of ferments every day and I'm doing okay with it. So there's a stage where you can eventually get to where you're introducing ferments. But in the early stages, some of the therapeutic probiotic can be of service and it takes a while to figure out which one's the right for you, but a variety of plant foods. Again, we're going back to real food. Eat a variety of plant foods and you will encourage a diversity in your microbiome. And more to this, it's not on the slide, but more to this, get outside and interact with your environment where you're breathing the air. There is information that starts to influence your microbiome based on whatever's happening in that environment. We were talking about this when we did the, the, the immunity series back in March when all of this was starting to show up. We were talking about you have to get out to different environments. The, the biome that lives in the area down by the Bow River is very different here in Calgary than what's living at the top of Nose Hill Park. So get to both areas and you'll start to introduce a bit of variety. Get your 10 month old playing with a pot of soil that comes from the garden sitting on the back deck like you were today. So those kinds of things where you're interacting with your environment and you are immersing yourself in that environment and you're also encouraging a variety of different kinds of vegetables, plants, fruits, 
grains, nuts, beans, seeds, all the plant foods under the planet. Um, olive oil is great to enhance different types of bacteria at the gut level. Butter helps with it too. Like, I mean, I'm focusing on plant foods because that's one of the biggest movers, but just in sure variety, that'll do such a great job in helping to enhance what's happening. But first look after helping to heal and seal the gut and then do the other layers as you go on. And those are three of the first beginning stages, I would say. Awesome. And I'll, I'll just add, obviously, that variety of, of plant foods uh, nourishing you with all its phytochemicals, all its information, but also is nourishing your microbiome with those, mm -hmm. those prebiotics, right? Those mm -hmm. fibers. Yeah. The food. So the probiotics eat the prebiotics. What are prebiotics? Plant food. Uh, fiber, different kinds of fiber, phytonutrients, phytochemicals. Sure. Plants. If you are eating plants, you're good. Do you need to eat benefiber? Not if you're eating regular plants. If you really want to get a really high kick of fiber, then start introducing lentils, super awesome fiber. Have lots of squash in your life. Eat a variety of different kinds of vegetables. Cabbage, super high fiber. Like bring on the real food. Benefiber is going to be like skipping the sprouting stage. Benefiber is sure high fiber, but it's not activated. So it's actually going to turn off your digestion and steal your body from minerals. So again, go with real food, which is not a popular opinion. I know people want a pill, too bad. So what, what did you call this, Benefiber? Yeah, or Metamucil or oh, like, the, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. the package, I'll take this and it'll improve my poops. Yeah. Yeah, well, if you do that for 30 years and then you get off it and then you can't function without it. Yeah, because you just enhance certain bacteria to live with that around. So there is a very slow methodical piece that we have to do to get you off of something like that to move you towards real food. It's not just night and day go from taking a powder that you put into the water and down. There's, you know, chia seeds. We can introduce chia pudding. We'll do some gut repair stuff because that type of fiber is actually quite abrasive and contributes to the leaky gut component. Like, yeah, there's other things we can do. So all to say the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining, which I love. Look after things. How is your body speaking? Is she speaking to you in hushed tones? Or is she using a loud voice right now? And when's the best time to start looking after some of this stuff? Probably yesterday. When's the second best time? Right now. How about it? Yeah, I was saying about planting a garden, planting a tree. When's the best time? Yesterday? Well, today? Okay, I'll get to it. It's the second best time today. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And also, oh my gosh, no one's getting out alive. So like, do what you can and then bless, get on with it, right? But yeah, loving up your guts so you can feel real good. That's where it's at. That's why your gut is ground zero. And it is the one piece that is common with everyone that I'm seeing in my practice. We used to joke about this in when I was in nutrition school. I don't know if you got this too, but when we have our case studies, then our instructors would always say, well, where are you going to start? And we were always thinking we had to look for something specific. And as you got through the majority of the school year, you started to realize that the answer is always going to be the same. You start at the gut. So let's start there. Yeah, awesome. There you go. So Ooh. if you want to feel real good, love up your guts, babies. Yeah, right on. Well, that was amazing. That was like fantastic. I know we went a little bit uh, over time, but hey, I mean, it was all just a, just a gem of information. I love how you simplified it. Love how you brought it right back down to, you know, like, like in nutrition school, you realize, okay, it's all about the gut. Well, let's start there and let's start working out. Uh, this insourcing. Love it. Thank you so much, yeah. Luca. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, totally. So let folks know how they can connect with you. I know we, you were mentioning about a program you have coming up. You're building all these online courses uh, that folks can really get deeper into this information, more the practical, okay, what does that look like in the kitchen? You've got so many resources. Let us know. I do. So you can see my website there. It's just my name, lucasimmons.com. Through there, you'll be able to find a lot. When you first land on that first page, there's a wait list. And that wait list is how I am. You can save your spot for that two week gut crash course that I've got going next week. It's also the wait list that is going to be for a meal planning and batch prep two week crash course we're doing in June it starts June 15th. And that's all online. They're both two weeks in length. It's a group program. So there's about hopefully 20 to 30 of us, a fairly good number of groups. You can get discussions going, but not too overwhelming that there's too many people with too many questions. So it's a really nice number to keep it 
real and to keep it accessible where you get two modules half hour a week plus a one hour session where we sit down there's daily prompts going on and lots of conversations back and forth recipes at every turn because if this is nothing else but delicious well i'm doing my job right so that's one of the pieces the other piece is that i also see clients one-on-one -on -one. so if you're struggling with trying to figure out well should i do one of the canned classes you have should i maybe do the gut crash course or should i see you one-on-one -on -one? i don't know which one to choose well i'll make it really easy for you in the comments below after we're done the live i'll, po I'll pop it in there but you can find my free 15-minute discovery call i spoke with a gal this morning she wasn't sure where to start but she knew she had histamine troubles well we figured out okay here could this roadmap look like for you where are you at time wise and financially and let's put something in place so you can have whatever level you're at to put those pieces in place to support you. So I have tons of free stuff, all the way up to taking a 12 week program that you can take. Uh, down the line, I'm gonna do a private coaching group to do histamine stuff. So there's lots of stuff on that's in the works right now, but the available stuff is that two week gut class, a two week batch prep and meal planning class that's coming in June. And then those individual canned classes, there's a histamine, a gut, uh, liver one, um, inflammation one, lots of stuff up online. So all of it's available through my website, lucasimmons.com. And then I'm always talking about it in my newsletter and social media. So follow those, connect with those. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Give her a follow here on Facebook and on Instagram. And uh, like I say, I mean, you know, we've been working together for years. Love, love, love the information you share, love the approach, the funness, the playfulness that you bring to everything. And you really do. You've just got, you know, testimonial after testimonial after testimonial of people that you've really helped. This is this this is the work. This is uh, at the community level, at the personal level, the family level of how we're we're changing the world and we're we're proactively making things better. I want to thank you for being on. Thanks to everyone that was watching. Uh, Luca will hop on. To to the comments myself as well we'll uh, we'll get to the, any of those if anybody's got any questions but uh, please share it out i mean this this is really important information i was totally blown away uh by this and uh yeah thanks again luca in source baby <laughs> that's right <laughs> all right thanks malcolm yeah bye-bye